In this video, you will continue your virtual attendance at the Best Practices Institute in Differentiation and attend, via video, a breakout session about applying differentiated strategies in the classroom. Conducting this session is middle school math teacher Susan Bergman, who is on sabbatical and working as a teacher educator. The subjects of her presentation are cubing and anchor activities and how she uses them in her math classroom. To begin, we asked Ms. Bergman to explain what each of these activities involves. Okay, we're going to do um, some cubing. I'll show them some cubing activities. And cubing is pretty much just um, having cubes. There's some pre-made ones out there. Um, I made all of my own, but it's just using cubes. And you um, usually have the kids just like throwing dice or something like that. You, you throw two cubes at a time, and one of them will tell you what you have to do, and the other one will tell you the, the problem or the situation you have to do that with. So, for example, with vocabulary, you have um, like define and example and counterexample, and then you have the vocabulary word on the other cube. And um, it's a great way to differentiate because you can kind of change up the levels while everybody's still doing the activity. Um, it's also good because you can use that for your kinesthetic learners. Um, so that's cubing. And then we're also going to look at anchor activities. And anchor activities, um, they can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, we usually use them in the classroom for, because we're differentiating, everybody kind of finishes at different times. So um, we want to make sure that everybody, um, we want to allow for that to happen. And if everybody finishing, is finishing at different times, then we need to have something else for them to do. Otherwise, in the classroom, kids will find something else for, them, for themselves to do. And we don't necessarily want them to do that. So um, they're more um, activities to keep them still thinking about math, still engaged in, in mathematical thinking. Um, but it's just the thing that they do when they finish um, the activity that I have planned for them. And now let's go to the breakout session, as Ms. Bergman introduces the subjects of her presentation. My name's Susan Bergman, and I teach eighth grade math at Crestview Middle School in the Rockwood School District in St. Louis. Um, I'm gonna walk you through a bunch of strategies that I've used in my classroom, and I'm gonna tell you that um, after this morning and after you probably went to your strand session, and you might have done a little bit with the no understand be able to do, I'm gonna present them to you in one fashion, but that's not necessarily how I would use them in the classroom. Um, a lot of these, well not a lot of them, a couple of them that we're actually going to do are more of your, of helping the kids differentiating your nose. So what do you want the kids to know? It's not so much the big picture, the understanding. Um, these are more of, instead of doing that rote practice that we like to use worksheets for, this is a fun way to do, do the worksheets. So um, I'm going to show you some of those. It's also good for your kinesthetic learners. So the way that we use it today may or may not be the worksheet's not good for your kinesthetic learners. Sorry, I should have clarified that. But the activity that we're going to do is good for your kinesthetic learners. So I'll kind of walk you through how I used it in my classroom. It wasn't necessarily the way we're going to use it today. But I want you to get involved in it because it's very hard to explain something that I did for differentiating and not show you how to do it and not, not actually get you engaged in it. Um, there's something else I was going to tell you. Oh, this stuff, I've been doing this for eight years. I started differentiating my very first year because I was told I had to. <laughs> because I started in Rockwood, and Rockwood was on, started learning from Carol very early when she started writing her books. Very early, back in 97, they put it in as a, um, it was a requirement that you must differentiate. I thought, okay. I must differentiate, and they're going to be looking for this. And so I started do it, and I'll tell you the one that I started with. Uh, but I, I did it from the very beginning. And so these things have been developed over time in, the, in my eight years experience. I did not do all of these at one time. This is not everything that I've done, but please don't, I, sometimes I have people leave and say, oh my gosh, I can't do all that. No, you can't do all that. That would be silly. I did, I, my suggestion for teachers when I'm teaching them about differentiation is that they try to do one a semester. Try to do one strategy semester. Don't get overwhelmed. Try one. Usually what happens, and for me what happened, was that it worked so well and I liked it so much that I was <coughs> then, and, and it's actually saved me time, which I know it does not sound like it when you first listen about it, but um, it saved me time and then that kind of motivated me to do a little bit more. How many of you have heard of um, anchor activities? Okay, okay, fabulous. Um, this is uh, just what I use as my anchor activity. And if you imagine when we were just doing the, um, I call it Puzzle Palace. Um, and the reason I call it Puzzle Palace is because when I student taught, the lady had Puzzle Palace and I just went with it. 
The fabulous thing that I found out about Puzzle Palace is then you can have a king and a queen, and you know if you go to Burger King and you tell me you're a teacher, they'll give you free crowns, and the kids love it. My eighth graders will walk around to lunch in their Burger King crown because they are the king or queen of Puzzle Palace for the week. So um, just a little another, I, I'm always looking for free stuff, so if you guys have any other ideas on wh how to get free stuff to use in your classroom, I'd love to hear them later this week. Um, okay, so Puzzle Palace, I put them in these three folders, and I'm going to give you some examples of what I use for Puzzle Palace. Okay, so basically what these are, these are anchor activities, and I know you're looking at them all, and you can look at the math, and we can talk about the math later, but these are anchor activities. This is the thing that I did when I learned that I had to differentiate. So this is, uh, you have to differentiate. So uh, this is what I thought I would do. I thought I was going to have differentiation in my classroom every day. This, I'm so glad that I started here because this is the best thing that I've done um, for management with differentiation. Notice when you were doing the order puzzles, what's one management question that most people would ask about that? What do you do if you're done? And that's where the Puzzle Palace comes in. That's where the anchor activities come in. I just have these three folders sitting up in my classroom, and they sit in one specific place in my room, and I've made it look like a palace. And um, I put some difficult ones in here. So, for example, if you have the It's a Wrap one, this is probably a little bit more difficult. And I have like 125 copies of them inside the red folder sitting up in a certain spot in my room. I have usually about 135 kids, so I figured... I usually make about 125 copies of them because um, every kid doesn't do every single one. Although many kids take all of them, they do, don't do every single one. Um, then the medium ability level I put in the yellow. So um, maybe like the fraction puzzle one or um, I don't know, the newspaper one. Um, I kind of went through and grouped these according to ability level when I copied a bunch of these. I put medium ones in here, and then I put the easy ones in the green, actually I did blue in my class, but um, in the green folder. And I just had 125 of the exact same one in my classroom. So when kids finish, they could go up and get Puzzle Palace. There were three to choose from. Now, I not only differentiated them according to ability level, but I also tried to make sure that they weren't the same type of thing in every one. So one of them, for example, this one is surface area, the it's a wrap. Then the fraction one is obviously practicing um, adding fractions and grouping fractions. The visual thinking one is visual thinking. And so I would have those up there so the kids could really look and say, oh, well, I really like logic puzzles, or I really like Sudoku, or I really like the visual thinking ones. So they weren't just picking according to ability levels, even though they knew the green was easy, the red was hard, and the yellow was medium. Um, and that way I could say, that this is what I thought, oh, I'm differentiating every day. Not really, but now, now that I started having this, it just, I wouldn't necessarily start with three. I would maybe just start with one as an anchor activity. You're just not differentiating it, and that's okay. But it so does save you for management. And then what I did is I have those three different puzzles. I change them every week. So I put new ones out on Monday, and on Friday they were due. Whether you were there or not, you had to turn it in by Friday. Um, I made them worth different points. So the yellow was worth two points. That was the medium one. The easy one was worth one point, and the hard one was worth three points. So one, two, and three points. The kids were required to get 15 points a quarter, and anything beyond that was extra credit. Now, you can get three points, two points, and one point. That's a total of six points per week. We have nine-week quarters, so math people, how many points could they get? Six times nine, 54. They could get 54 points. Um, they could get 54 points all quarter if they did every single one of them and got every single one of them right. But um, at the end of the quarter, they have to turn these in by Friday, remember? So at the end of the quarter, I had that problem of people coming up to me, oh my gosh, I have an 89, what can I do for extra credit? And you're like scrambling for extra credit? No, once I started doing Puzzle Palace, which I did the first year, once I actually figured out that it would work like this, um, I, I said, sorry, you had extra credit avail available to you all quarter long. You didn't take advantage of it. And so then you don't ever have to, and I tell parents about Puzzle Palace at Open House so that they know. I tell them that they can take Puzzle Palace home with them if they want. I, I have no problem if they want to work at the dinner table as a family to do Puzzle Palace. Who cares? They're doing math as a family. That's more than I could get them to do before. So I had no problem if they were going to do it with their mom or their dad or, or anything like that. By the way, what do you use for Puzzle Palace? You use that stuff that's been sitting around that you always say, oh, if I just had time to do, or, oh, this doesn't really um, relate to the state standards anymore, but it's fabulous for their thinking skills. 
It's that it's the stuff that may or may not you'll notice some of the stuff doesn't necessarily tie in with their, my curriculum. I can't necessarily say, oh, this ties in with this state standard, but this is fabulous logical thinking, and that's what I need my kids to learn. So that's where I, what I did, and I just bought books that were instructional fare that you could you could copy out of and, and stuff like that. Um, there's lots of problem of the week, problem of the day websites, so you can you know Google those. That's probably where I would start. And you probably have stuff that is just sitting there that if you went back, like for me, I went back through my old stuff and I was like, oh, I forgot about this. And that means that I need to put it in my Puzzle Palace binder. And you have to go through and clean them out after a while. Some of them get old and whatever. All right, moving on. Um, cubing activities. I love cubing activities. And this is in your handout. And I gave you lots and lots of lots of cubing activities. Let me tell you the way I used to do it. The very first one I came up with was the, um, the, the right triangle one. So I had legs and I had hypotenuses of triangles and I think I gave you a whole bunch of these um, in there, did I? Yes. And I have like right triangle, or yeah, right triangle leg, high level fractions, red paper. So I had like all of these different cubes that I made and so this was when we were practicing the Pythagorean theorem because they have to practice it. This is again just for them to practice using it. It wasn't necessarily for them to practice understanding how it worked. But um, it's much better than doing a worksheet. And I just did um, a whole bunch of different levels. So I had easy legs, um, I had medium legs, and I had harder leg of the triangle. And then I had easy, medium, and harder of the hypotenuse. And the easy was like whole numbers. I think the medium was like decimals or maybe just the harder um, whole numbers. And then the hard was fractions. And they had to do it with fractions with no calculator, and that's it. And then I, you have so many different choices, and there was all these different choices when I made these. So basically what you did was you gave the kids, you figured out what level they were going to be at, and don't feel like you have to have 80 different levels. You don't. It just so happens I wanted to figure out how many different choices I had, and then I would pick kids in, into the groups where they belonged. Then you just have them roll the cubes, and they roll them, and then they wrote down, and I don't know if I gave you the... I think that page before that, yep, page 15, what does it say on cube one? So this person would write six centimeters. What does it say on cube two? Twelve and a half centimeters. Then they had to show their work, they had to find the length of the missing side, and then they had to show their work to find the area of the triangle. And we played it as a game, so whoever had the highest area of a triangle got the points for that round. And then the, your friend would roll it, and then they would do it, and then they'd find out, do the whole problem. So again, it was just practice. If you do any kind of cubing activities, do not do what I did and do not make it with paper, okay? Because it only takes about a year for them to look like this, okay? And, and sometimes it only takes about 45 minutes for them to look like this because it is very tempting to take these and smash them up. Um, so don't do that. Just go and buy. It took me like six years to get the smart, but go and just buy cubes. They're not that much. This was $10.95 from Science Kit. This one was actually from um, CC, let's see, it's www.ccwproducts.com. I think that's like Classroom Warehouse or something like that. Then you just write on them. With I use, I use um, regular ink. I don't use, you can use Sharpie, but the problem with Sharpies is that they kind of bleed on this, on this material because also, my very first mistake that I bought, I got smarter and bought the cubes, but I bought the wooden and the plastic cubes. If you want to go home with a headache, then buy those. But otherwise, buy these foam cubes. And the, the um, Sharpies kind of do um, bleed a little bit on these. But if you use regular ink, it works just fine. Um, and you can, then you have all the different colors. So I can put it, I can still color code them. And then I started making them with vocabulary so that we could practice our vocabulary. So the purple cubes in here are, the, all the purple cubes say the same thing. Definition on two of the sides, counterexample on two of the sides, and example on two of the sides. And then all the other ones have vocabulary words on them. So coefficient, adjacent, chord, um, let's see, rhombus, sum, prime. And then they threw, they rolled a purple cube and one of the other cubes, and then you know they had to give whatever it said. An example of a rhombus. They had to draw an example of a rhombus. A counterexample of a rhombus. They had to draw a non-example of a rhombus. 
And the fabulous thing with this is, again, this is for your kinesthetic learners, because those are always, for me, the hardest to come up with what to do with. So this is a kinesthetic way to practice vocabulary. And if you want to differentiate it, like I did with the um, Pythagorean theorem ones, you can. Any questions about the cubes and how you can use them? Go. How do the students get feedback when they know they're right or wrong? Like they're rolling that one, they're rolling that one, they're putting their work down, they're showing it. That's why you, I made it a game, because you're more likely to check your neighbors if it's a risk that they might win by doing it incorrectly. So I made it a game, so they were playing against a partner, and then oh. they were able. The other nice thing is you're giving them the, all the activities that I shared with you so far. What have I had to do? I prepped, but then after that, I, yeah, I walked around and could facilitate, and then I could check as I was walking around and see if you got it right. And I, you know which ones you need to be checking. All right, um, here's, I gave you all the examples. You can do it with quadrilaterals. Um, I think I gave you all the rest of them. I don't know if I gave you quadrilaterals or not. Um, I'm not gonna. Go, I'm just gonna go through a couple more things pretty quickly. If you wouldn't mind just taking all my supplies, putting them together, and the, putting everything back where it belongs, and if you just put them like towards the end of your desk. Um, pretest came up in the back. We were talking about pretest. I pre-assess them at the very beginning of the year, and then I also pre-assess at the beginning of a unit. So I do two pre-assessments. Um, exit slips are the best way that I've found to pre-assess. I do exit slips, I have a question on the board, it's either over what I just taught that day, it's over what I'm going to teach the next day, or it's something that's asking about their interest or their learning style. Well, we do learning style inventories, but something about their interest, I have that on the board. And then the extra puzzle palace, you know, the ones that get left each week that never got done, I cut them up into little pieces of paper and we use the back of them as an exit slip. And so if, if you would have been in my classroom th today, I would have had this little piece of paper sitting like right by the door over there in, in a little bucket and you would have come in, picked up an exit slip, gone and sat down at your, door, at your desk and the exit slip is most of the time on the board when they come in. Sometimes I just put it on there at the very end when I don't want them to do it ahead of time. But they do the exit slip and then I use that as my pre-assessment. So I still do a pre-assessment at the beginning of the year. I do a pre-assessment at the beginning of each unit just to kind of get an idea of where I need to go with them and who does seem to know. But the exit slips are my favorite way to pre-assess. I just started to collect their exit slips when they were leaving and I made piles in my hand. Got it, didn't get it, kinda got it in my hand. On top, got it. On bottom, didn't get it. In the middle, kind of got it. And then I got my groups for the next day. You two are a partner pair. You two are a partner pair. I stapled them together, threw them in the inbox for my next day. And then I just pulled those out and I said, oh, Caitlin and Ryan, you two are going to work together over here. And, and then I didn't have to have a system. And I didn't mess with, you know, oh, these two can't work together and these two can't. You have it on their exit slips, just staple them all together and put them in. I did it in the four-minute passing period. I made my groups for the next day. So that's what I would suggest with the exit slips and for the pretests. Yep. For us, I many people that are just starting with this, you know, you try your goal might be one in a semester. Where are you now? Where am I now? In a semester, in a week. Well, on an average, it, it is, seriously, where are you? I'm not in the classroom this year. Well, so if you're in the classroom, where are you? I thought I'd get out of the answer there. Um, <laughs> I probably, I would say that I have Puzzle Palace all the time. Um, I would say that I'm definitely getting a lot better at it. Um, so I'd say probably close to once a week, but not every week. We have some kind of we have some kind of activity now. Does that mean I th I can do pretty I've gotten pretty good at the management part side of it that I can pretty much say okay well it seems like you all have already done your exit slip and you really get it but um, it seems like you know I need to pull pull a couple three of you or whatever why don't the three of you come down and sit with me and we sit on the floor because eighth graders like to sit on the floor because they don't get to do that it's like you know those kindergarten teachers get to do it every day we don't get to do it every day so I pull them down on the floor we bring our little whiteboards and we practice it together those four or whatever might practice a couple word problems from their book and I might put three of them on the computers and um, there I have a, like auditory websites that I found along the way so I've gotten to the point where I can kind of do that on a whim like when I start to notice that they're not really getting it or I can kind of do it on a whim according to their interest but I'd say on average probably once a week but like I said not not every single week any Anything else? Okay, I'm going to stop, but we do need to do one last processing time. 
Just draw this on your paper. A triangle with a three in the middle of it, a circle with a two in the middle of it, and a square with a one in the middle of it, wherever you want. This is just wherever. All right, here's what you're going to do. Next to the three, you're gonna say, what three things do you wanna remember from what you learned today? Next to the two, what are two questions still circling around in your head? And next to the one, the square, what is one, one things, I guess I should change that. What is one thing that really squares up your beliefs? So this is just some solo processing time for you. Three, two, one. <laughs> 